Hello and welcome to Ag PhD. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for joining us today. Over the last couple months, we've been talking a lot about nutrients in crops and even getting into some of the micronutrients. Well, today we're going to focus on manganese. That's a good thing to look at, Brian, but one thing I'm concerned about today and I want to focus on is changing planting populations out in fields. We've got a lot of data to look through from our farm, and I'm sure you do on yours as well, about what populations worked on which hybrids or which varieties. We'll talk about how to make those decisions today. Well, coming up later in the show, we've got a Weed of the Week, we have an Iron Talk as well, but first, here's this week's Farm Basics. Your soybeans are in the bin, but the game isn't over yet. Score more points this year by taking your beans to the end zone. At $10 Beans, every point of moisture below your target takes away 15 cents per bushel. Reclaim that lost yield with the end zone bin system from Farm Shop MFG. During our Farm Basics time today, we're going to talk about the seed germination test and just the different types of tests that are available to farmers so they have good information on the seed they want to put in the ground. Well, if you're a farmer or if you're a gardener and you're going to be planting seed, one of the things you'll notice on the bag of seed that you get is what the germination percentage is. Now, what that tells you is out of every 100 seeds, you expect 90 or 95 or 99 percent of them to germinate and grow. Well, that's great information because if you had on the germination test, well, 20 percent germination, well, what a waste if you have to buy 100 seeds only to get 20 to grow. So farmers obviously want to see big numbers and gardeners would be the same way. Well, there are other types of germination tests. So, for example, the cold germination test or the saturated cold germination test. Saturated would be wet, basically. But the point is, in stress conditions, how well does the plant grow? So, like on our farm, I'm super interested in what's that cold germination score? If the warm germination score is 95% for my corn, that's pretty good. But we like to plant when it's really cold, maybe 45 degrees outside or something like that. And you go, well, wait a second. Uh, the warm germination test, that's run when it's 70 degrees. It's not going to be 70 degrees for a long time. Let's look at the cold germination test. If that says 90% or 85%, I mean, it's fine, but we just as farmers have to understand, okay, that's the risk that I've got there. I'm going to literally lose 5% or 10% of my plants if I plant into cold soils. To me, is that worth it or is it not? Well, it certainly is a consideration. And let's just say that you had a low cold germination score. Does that mean that seed's not okay to plant? No, that doesn't mean that at all. It just means you probably shouldn't plant it when it's cold. You should probably leave that for later in the <laughs> yep. planting season and put it in when the soil's warm back up. Right, and could you overcome some of that with other cultural practices? Well, it would help. I mean, if let's say you worked the soil, you tilled it black, that soil's going to be warmer than if you were in no-till or maybe even just a little bit in strip-till. But especially the no-till where all that residue's out there, you go, boy, I've either got to have a cold, germination score that's great or I have to wait just a little bit longer than the conventional till person to let the soil warm up. Now you may be thinking who pays for all this testing? Does the farmer or the gardener have to pay for that or does the seed company that's selling it have to pay? Well the seed company is paying for at least a warm germination test and that's what you'll normally see on most tags so they'll pre-print it right on the bag so you know okay the warm germ score is this. However, if you want more test data, like the saturated cold germ test, for example, I don't know any seed company that's running those. So you're going to have to run that on your own as the farmer or gardener or user of the product. So if you want additional testing, you've got to write the check. Well, once again, a germination test is just going to tell how many plants are going to grow. And there are varying tests out there like warm and cold germ scores. These are all important if you want top yields, but so is weed control. Can you identify this week's Weed of the Week? Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whenever you want, in your life and on your farm, Case IH AFS Connect gives you more control. Monitor your operation, manage your fleet, and your farm data your way. Case IH, rethink productivity. Yield Track has tracks in its DNA. I have with me Matt Meyer, 
lead yield track planner engineer from Norwood Sales. Matt, what makes these tracks so special? Well, Bill, these tracks were designed with a spherical bearing as the main pivot that allows oscillation, camber, and steering from a single mechanism. The design has five degrees of camber to match the crown of the road, resulting in a faster and cooler road transport. Yield track then uniquely locks out this camber in the field to maximize the belt soil contact ratio, improving flotation while minimizing both belt wear and soil compaction. Finally, we add an infield steering option for those who need auto guidance, especially those doing strip till, making this track system unmatched in the industry. Well, thank you, Matt. You can only get these tracks on a yield track planner. Call Norwood Sales for more information. Pentair Hypro 3D nozzles are your premier choice for fungicide applications. Syngenta fungicide application field trials have shown Hypro 3D nozzles provide a yield advantage of up to 10% over other nozzles, maximizing the return on your fungicide investment. Learn more at pentair.com slash hypro. Call it a day. One more post. One more bucket. There's always one more to be done one more field to be earned to be found for us it always has been and always will be one more bushel When you apply phosphate fertilizer, it binds to calcium in the soil, becoming calcium phosphate, essentially tooth enamel. How much of this tooth do you think will become available to your crop? NutriCharge doubles your phosphate availability by protecting it from calcium fixation. Today in the show, we're gonna talk a little about manganese. It's an important micronutrient that every one of your crops absolutely has to have. Well, again, here's another micronutrient that on many soil tests, we don't see it even measured. So make sure if you're pulling soil analysis on your farm, get a complete test where you have the essential micronutrients like manganese on the test too. It's one that we're gonna look at in addition to how does it compare to the other micros, for example, iron. We wanna see the iron at just a little bit higher level than manganese. We don't want manganese to get higher than iron. That's one of those ratios that we'll look at on soil tests. Around the United States and in Canada as well, we see two common testing methods. It's either the Malik 3 or the DTPA test for micronutrients. Well, with most nutrients, it kind of correlates. So there is some type of ratio you can look at. So we say, all right, if it's this on the DTPA, it's probably roughly this on the Malik 3. That all works fine, except for one nutrient, manganese. The problem with manganese is, especially as that soil pH goes higher, the manganese level on the DTPA test goes lower. On the Malik 3 test, it doesn't appear that way to us at least. So we still see the manganese level, if it's truly there in the soil, regardless of the pH, it's gonna show up in the Malik 3. So we very often will call the Malik 3 what's in the soil for manganese. And with the DTPA, we look at more of, well, that should be available. And it might even be a little more than that, but we don't know for sure. So with most soil test numbers, we say, yep, it's this, let's fertilize to this. We feel really good about this yield and we're good. But with manganese, if you're getting a DTPA test, I honestly can't say that exactly. What I would prefer you to do is get a Malik 3 test just for manganese and a DTPA test just for manganese, and then let's compare the two. If both are really low, well now you absolutely have to apply manganese to your soil. If one is high, like the Malik 3 is high and your DTPA is really low, well if you get the pH down and you get some microbials going in your soil, maybe that manganese comes available and you don't have to worry about actually fertilizing with manganese. And specifically to that pH, I think on our farm, when we get down in that 6.2, 6.3 range and lower, we see more manganese show up in our DTPA test. That's what Brian was talking about. And one of the places that it really plays out is in disease prevention, like white mold, for example, where high levels of manganese are available to the crop. We typically see no white mold or less white mold than in areas of the field where we don't have good manganese availability. Now, that may have something to do with soil pH as well, because typically in lower, poorly drained soils, we see more white mold and we have higher pH too. The other spot where manganese is tremendously important is emergence. So if you do have a soil that's a little low on manganese, yes, you can go apply manganese sulfate as a broadcast if you would like to do it. 
but you could also put some manganese on with the planter. Now, manganese is not exactly like boron, where you have to really be concerned about getting too much in one area and it being toxic. You can put a fair amount of manganese out there, but many times what we'll do with our planter is we might put a quart or two quarts of manganese chelate there to help get that plant off to a real good start. Manganese is another great example of nutrients that most farmers aren't even applying to their fields. So if you haven't been applying manganese, you can look at the free Ag PhD fertilizer removal app and see how much manganese each of your crops is taking out of the soil. If you're taking a little bit out every year and never putting any back, it makes a lot of sense that you may see a return on investment replenishing your soil with some of those nutrients like manganese. And there are a lot of different manganese products out in the market. We see many blends of micros where we've got three, four, five different micronutrients in the product, putting micros out at low levels. And most of the time farmers are banding that along the row as they plant. One last thing that I've got here is Roundup and manganese. So back a few years ago, there were some people talking about Oh, if you put Roundup on, it's going to tie up all your manganese in the soil and in the crop. That's ridiculous. We have never found that to be true when we have applied unbelievably huge, massive rates, so much that I can't tell you how much we put on. But trust me, we put on enough for 10 lifetimes and we still saw no difference in the soil with manganese. We saw no difference in the plant with manganese. What it really comes back to is People are just short on manganese around the country and around the world because most people are simply not applying it. And when you start removing crops year after year after year, you're taking manganese off every year. Manganese is somewhat mobile in the soil. So think about nitrogen. If you didn't put any nitrogen on for the next 10 years, of course you're gonna have horrible yields. If you did the same thing with sulfur or boron, any of these leachables, that's the way it's gonna be. Well, manganese doesn't leach as fast, but it does move out through that soil profile. So what I'm saying here is, if you haven't put on manganese in the last few years, you need to. And it's not the fault of Roundup why your crop is short on manganese, it's the fault that you haven't fertilized with it. And if you haven't been fertilizing with manganese, we'd recommend do some trial work on your own farm. Start with one field, put some manganese on part of the field and don't put it on the other or try some various rates out there to learn what works in your soil and in your crop rotation. Yeah, and we're not saying you have to use a whole crazy amount of manganese, but spend $2, spend $5, something like that on manganese. It will pay in a lot of cases if you haven't been fertilizing with manganese over the last few years. One other thing that always pays on farms is controlling our weed of the week. We'll show you how to stop this weed later in the show. Success isn't just about maintaining your operation, how you make out for the season, or how much you can get from each acre. It's about doing precisely what needs to be done to feed your crop and grow your legacy, all the way down to the last drop. AgroLiquid Precision Crop Nutrition. Apply less, expect more. Find a retailer at agroliquid.com. Each year brings new and unique challenges to farming, and your operation needs to constantly adapt to meet them. That's why at AgBiome, we're working every day to bring you new and better solutions, microbial-based solutions that protect your crop and help it reach its full potential. To learn more about how we're doing it, visit agbiome.com. AgBiome, feeding the world responsibly, partnering with microbes for human benefit. I don't so much worry about how much I spend, I worry about the return on my investment. 
I've tried so many things to try to be better and try to increase profitability and I finally felt like I hit a home run. The Soil Warrior has enabled me to decrease hours on tractors by running two trips and one pass at high speeds and my fuel savings has been tremendous. I love looking at harvest results because there is so much to learn. And one of the tests that many farmers across the country did this year was to vary the planting population as they move throughout fields and from field to field. Now's your chance to evaluate which planting populations worked with which hybrids or varieties this year. Okay, and here's the reason why I hate that information, because every year the weather's totally different. Last year, we flooded out. This year, we dried out. Well, guess what? Last year, high planting populations were better. This year, lower populations were better. Okay, what's gonna be next year? I don't really know exactly. So it's all kind of relative out there too. If you're in an area that can produce tremendously high yields, you're probably gonna run with higher populations. If you're looking at lower yields, it's usually lower populations. And I'll just give you a specific example of what I'm talking about. With corn, we usually bring up the numbers seven to 10 per thousand. So in other words, if I plant 30,000 plants, that's 30 times seven, that'd be 210 bushels or times 10, that'd be 300 bushels. So in other words, if I plant 30,000 plants per acre, I should be somewhere in that 210 to 300 bushel range. So if I'm now getting right at 300, I go, you know what? I probably should bump my population a little bit to go over 300. If I'm only getting 180 or 150, you're planting too much. And I'm not saying it's bad to plant that population, but what I'm saying is you could save some money, take maybe 10 or $20 out of your corn seed bill and put it to something else. Maybe it's nutrients, maybe it's tile, I don't know. But the point is you don't need that population in our opinion as agronomists. I've gotten a chance to travel to different growing areas around the world and meet a lot of really good producers. And one that I would point out that's done a lot of work on planting populations is Eric Watson down in New Zealand. He's the world record wheat grower and he plants lower populations than we're planting on our farm and getting more than double the yield we're getting. So obviously there's a few things that he's learned over the years. Now one of the cool little trials that he's doing too is looking at different varieties, seeing how many tillers each will produce. We're doing the same thing in corn, looking at how much ear flex can we get out of different hybrids. Or in soybeans, if we have lower populations, how many more branches will they put out? And the answer that we're trying to derive from all this testing is which hybrids or varieties respond to lower planting populations, which ones need higher planting populations. So in addition to your yield level and the weather, you also want to look at the varieties to see if they can even tolerate varying that population. Two other things I think about here are weed control and fertility. So for example, if you want or need better weed control, that means you need to plant thicker. The more plants you have of whatever it is, corn, soybeans, wheat, it's going to shade the ground faster and now you're going to have that better weed control because don't ever forget, crop canopy is the very best weed killer that there is. On the fertility side, I'd say this, if let's say you wanna bump your corn planting population, don't even dream about doing that if you don't fertilize accordingly. You've gotta have a tremendous amount of potassium in your soil, like thousands of pounds very often, in order to have the adequate potassium you need all through every single day of the growing season to produce a good stock, so you don't have big lodging issues. That's one of the reasons why we see wind tip certain fields over and not tip other fields over. It all has to do with how much potassium is in the soil in addition to copper and manganese and some other nutrients. So really take a look at what do you have for overall fertility before you go bumping that planting population. And as Brian mentioned before, you may look at this as a risk management tool where on the dry years you may benefit from lower population, the wet years you may benefit from higher populations. So you may plant a few different populations across each field on your farm just so you're spreading your risk out because you never know what the weather's going to do. Okay, the last example I want to give is we were talking about higher populations with corn. Let's say it's in good areas or you know if you're going to have a lot of rain. So many times it's in the low ground we want to plant higher populations with corn. 
It's the opposite with soybeans. Very often what we talk about here with soybeans is, hey, let's have a higher population on the light ground. I might want to plant 160 or 180,000 plants per acre on the light ground and on the hilltops because that's where the beans don't do that well anyway. That's going to push the beans taller and very often you'll get a little bit more yield. Now in the low ground where you have more white mold, more just diseases in general, there's all kinds of fertility there. You don't need all that population. That's where you could cut the population back. So as a farmer, I still love an average of 130 or 140,000 seeds per acre, but I'm going to vary it depending on my soil type. The cool thing is with modern technology, you can write prescriptions and load it right into your equipment so your equipment will do it automatically as you go through the field. That's really cool. Also, if you're just thinking, hey, today I'm going to vary the population and I didn't write a prescription, no problem. Oftentimes with just one press of a button, you can vary that population right now in a field and do some check strips here and there. Well, Darren, I wish with one press of the button, we could control weeds like our Weed of the Week. It's not that easy, but it is fairly easy to control this week's weed. We'll tell you how to do it on your farm coming up next. The Weed of the Week is brought to you by Corteva AgriScience, Agriculture Division of Dow DuPont. Finish the fight against tough weeds with the Enlist Weed Control System. Weeds are tough. But we're tougher. With unrivaled weed control. Reduced drift. And near zero volatility. So, who's tough now? Weed of the Week is Arkansas Wild Rose. Well, if you're wondering how do we kill a wild rose plant, it's very much the same as killing a desirable rose plant in your landscaping. Just accidentally spray your weed control over it, uh, like say maybe Brian or I did as young kids. Uh, maybe we got 2,4-D a little too close to that rose plant and yeah, you could create a lot of problems in a real hurry. Well, yeah, but I will say this, with Arkansas Wild Rose, a light rate of 2,4-D will appear to control it and then it comes back later. So if you want permanent control, you've either got to run with a high rate of dicamba or 2,4-D. You certainly could use Roundup where that fits, but Roundup, I don't know if I would call that the best. What I really like is more of a brush killer because when I think about Arkansas Wild Rose, it's a shrub. That's really what it is. Well, how do you kill shrubs? You use products like chaparral, tordon, maybe vaslan. I mean, there are a lot of different choices out there for you. As you may be able to tell, this is a weed that doesn't normally pop up in cultivated fields. We see it in grassy areas. We see it in pastures. Most commonly, roadside ditches. Yep. That's where we see it. Yep, and the reason why is just because there isn't all the competition in the roadside ditch that there is in all these other areas. So usually out in cropland, if you just have a great crop, it's going to choke that Arkansas wild rose out. You don't even have to use herbicides in the cropland. Yeah, and you may say, well, if it's just in the ditches or grassy areas, why do you need to control this weed? You don't have to, but if you're going to bale up that grass or if you're going to graze it, yep. this is certainly one that's going to take water and nutrients away from the grass. So it is going to be uh, something that will limit grazing out there or limit grass production for your grazing well, animals. Yeah, plus it's a little bit thorny. So if you're going to walk through it on a regular basis, you got those thorns to contend with. That's all the time we have for this week's Weed, but Iron Talk is coming up next. Who says harvest should be the only rewarding part of the season? Sure, ending a successful year of planning and planting is a very gratifying moment, but with the Bayer Plus Rewards program on your side, it doesn't have to be the only one. By helping you earn and redeem cash back on seed, herbicides, and other eligible products you use throughout the entire season, you can reap the benefits all year round. So contact your retailer to learn how to get more from your crops and put more in your wallet. Bayer Plus. Rewards are always in season. What I look for in a seed isn't just in the seed. It's people I trust who get me the salve without the cell. Who show me where their seed fits 
and even where it doesn't. Because the only innovation that matters is the one I need. With NK Seeds, progress means pushing my potential. And success matters. How much does your crop residue cost you? Over time, residue accumulates in your field, building excess carbon levels and tying up your plant available nitrogen. Residue also traps P, K, and micros and can take years to naturally become available to your crops. This is because soil lacks the diverse microbial life needed to break it all down. With Decomp, you can naturally restore life to your soils and allow the release of valuable crop fertility. Learn more at heftyseed.com slash naturals. Success isn't just about maintaining your operation, how you make out for the season, or how much you can get from each acre. It's about doing precisely what needs to be done to feed your crop and grow your legacy. All the way down to the last drop. Agroliquid Precision Crop Nutrition. Apply less, expect more. Find a retailer at agroliquid.com. Your soybeans are in the bin, but the game isn't over yet. Score more points this year by taking your beans to the end zone. If your beans went in the bin at low moisture, you can naturally rehydrate to reclaim lost yield with the end zone fan control system from Farm Shop MFG. At $10 beans, every point of moisture below your target takes away 15 cents per bushel. That means raising 9% moisture beans to 13 can increase your profits by 60 cents per bushel. Score more yields in the end zone from Farm Shop MFG. Iron Talk is brought to you by Case IH. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whenever you want, in your life and on your farm, Case IH AFS Connect gives you more control. Monitor your operation, manage your fleet and your farm data your way. Case IH. Rethink productivity. There is so much work to do in the spring that finding a way to do two things at once can really save some time. Even if you had a great fall and got a lot done, chances are that you still have nitrogen to apply to cornfields and pre-emerge herbicides as well. I'll share some tips to help mixing the two go smoothly in today's Iron Talk. Full disclosure here, we mix liquid fertilizer with pre-plant herbicides every year on our farm on thousands of acres, and yes, we've had trouble a couple of times in the past. However, we mix the two with full confidence today based on what we've learned, which is why I'm excited to share with you these five steps to successfully mixing herbicides and fertilizer. First, do a jar test. Do your exact mixture in advance in a small clear jar in the same mixing order that you plan to do it in your tank. Also, if you really want to play it safe, jar test with each batch of fertilizer that you get as there may be some variance batch to batch throughout the season. Second, herbicides may not mix well with straight fertilizer. It's best to mix some water into the solution first or dilute the herbicide with water before putting it into the tank. This gives the herbicide something to bind to as fertilizer isn't always the best host. Have a jug of Convert on hand just in case you have any issues or better yet, to prevent issues. That's a compatibility agent, and it works to solve a ton of issues throughout the spray season, and it makes tank cleanout easier, too. Third, warmer temperatures help nearly everything work better, so keeping fertilizer and herbicide in warm storage always helps. Fourth, agitation throughout the whole process can keep things in suspension. And finally, the fifth thing, don't let spray tanks with blended products sit. Mix up only what you're going to spray right away. You can save some time and get two things done at once this spring, most pre-plant herbicides can be mixed with fertilizers. Just follow our five steps to avoid problems on your farm. That's all for today's Iron Talk, and now back to the show. That's all the time we have for today's show, but if you're looking for more agronomic information, we'd encourage you to check out the Ag PhD radio show where we take your live phone calls and answer your emails on the show each weekday at 2 p.m. Central on Sirius XM channel 147. And don't miss the next Ag PhD TV show. We'll have another Weed of the Week, Farm Basics, Iron Talk, and a whole lot more. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for watching Ag PhD.